In the fields of marketing and brand management, it is extremely important to understand the perceptions and interests of your audience. For example, if you were marketing a product to moms, you'd probably do well to highlight how the product benefits their children's health or makes their jobs easier in the household. When dealing with an entertainment market such as video games, the objective is the same, but things get a bit more complicated. In this particular market, it is critically important to communicate the correct information to your consumers and to do so in a way that does not alienate them before the product is in their hands, thanks to the nature of the pre-order culture surrounding video games. Because video game promotions begin several months or more before the release of the product, it is crucial that consumers are primed to make their purchases in advance whenever possible. For this reason, every piece of information released about a game could be the difference between securing a pre-order or having a consumer withdraw their commitment to the product. As a person with a public relations background who has spent years studying and working on behalf of brands including within the gaming industry, and as a person who is fervently passionate about games in general, I felt it would be appropriate to weigh in on a rather noteworthy PR disaster hitting one of gaming's most celebrated franchises of all time. Pokemon in the case of Pokemon Sword and Shield, a significant controversy made its way into the minds of consumers when veteran developer and series producer Junichi Masuda revealed that not all Pokemon from the franchise would be returning in the newest installment during a Nintendo livestream in June 2019. Without citing too many reasons for the decision other than the difficult transition to new hardware, this announcement would prove to be one of the greatest controversies both the Pokemon franchise and Game Freak, the studio behind the games, would ever face. Firstly, one might wonder why this statement would become a large issue for consumers. The Pokemon franchise, at the time of the statement, already had over 800 different creatures that players could collect across each game in the series, and for anyone who knows the Pokemon branding, starting all the way back in the 90s, gotta catch em all has always been the mantra. As one might expect, the announcement that players will not be able to catch em all goes very against the spirit of the series. Not only would the Pokemon not be attainable in-game, but even bringing them in from previous games, as has been series convention, would not be possible unless they were on the select list of Pokémon chosen for Sword and Shield. The controversy would plague not only Game Freak, but all Nintendo-related live streams and social media, with players and fans clamoring for all Pokémon to be brought into the game, including the hashtag #BringBackNationalDex, a demand for the full version of the Pokémon encyclopedia, known as the Pokédex, to be included in the game. Before we go into the ways I believe Game Freak and Nintendo should have resolved this controversy, we're going to review precisely what they've done between June 2019, the time the controversy began, and November 2019, the month in which the games are released. June 11, 2019. Junichi Masuda makes a statement during the Nintendo Treehouse Live showcase at E3, revealing that not all Pokémon will return in the new Pokémon Sword and Shield game. He cites development constraints and game balance as the key reasons. Fan outcry begins across social media almost immediately, including critiques against the purpose of the newly announced Pokemon Home, a service that allows players to store all of their Pokemon in one spot. Two days later, on June 13th, 2019, Masuda once again reiterates that not all Pokemon will return during interviews with assorted outlets. Game director Omori also states in an interview with Famitsu that the Pokemon models are being built from the ground up for Sword and Shield. June 28th, Masuda releases a formal statement about the controversy. It reads as follows. Thank you to all of our fans for caring so deeply about Pokemon. Recently, I shared the news that some Pokemon cannot be transferred to Pokemon Sword and Pokemon Shield. I've read all your comments and appreciate your love and passion for Pokemon. Just like all of you, we are passionate about Pokemon, and each and every one of them is very important to us. After so many years of developing the Pokemon video games, this was a very difficult decision for me. I'd like to make one thing clear. Even if a specific Pokemon is not available in Pokemon Sword and Pokemon Shield, that does not mean it will not appear in future games. The world of Pokemon continues to evolve. The Galar region offers new Pokemon to encounter, trainers to battle, and adventures to embark on. We are pouring our hearts into these games, and we hope you will look forward to joining us on this new journey. June 28th, 2019, Junichi Masuda. October 2019. Game Informer conducts interviews with Masuda and other Game Freak staff. Masuda confirms once again that Pokemon cut from Sword and Shield will return in future Pokemon titles. He also explains some mechanic differences that support the game balance argument, including statements that all Pokemon in Sword and Shield will be, in some capacity, competitively viable. November 2019. Pokemon Sword and Shield game content is leaked online, including which Pokemon will not be returning, numbering at over half the total number of existing Pokemon. Game Freak also cancels a Pokemon Sword and Shield release event, citing operational reasons as the cause. 
In the wake of all this controversy, a new hashtag spawns from fans titled hashtag thank you game freak in support of the company for all they've done. November 12th, 2019. Data miners get their hands on the game files for Pokemon Sword and Shield and allege that Game Freak's previous statements that remaking character models and creating new animations for existing Pokemon are a complete lie, as the assets and animations are, allegedly, identical to those used in previous games, Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. November 13th, the Pokemon Sword and Shield review embargo is lifted. The game receives generally favorable reviews from critics. November 15th, the release of Pokemon Sword and Shield. At this time, no further statements have been made regarding any of the allegations issued against the Pokemon Company or Game Freak. Based on this timeline, we have a fairly clear idea of how Game Freak decided to handle the controversy, opting to address it during the initial month of June, then remaining relatively silent on the issue until October during formal interviews. With that said, I'll now weigh in on the choices Game Freak and their representatives made in this time frame, and whether or not I believe it was the right move. We'll start with the inciting incident, Masuda's statements during Nintendo Treehouse Live. Nintendo Treehouse Live is a video game showcase where developers speak with show hosts about their new titles. The program has always come across as a sort of open dialogue with the developers, which in most cases is a wonderful opportunity for fans and consumers to get a closer look at who is making these games, and what sort of thoughts they have on the process. One of the biggest challenges of a live showcase in any industry is always going to be the potential for guests and representatives to go off script and say something they shouldn't. The second challenge in this scenario comes from a language barrier, particularly when the interviews are conducted with translators who relay information between the hosts who speak English and the developers who speak Japanese. These two factors make for a very dangerous formula where things can go wrong. In any scenario with a live interview, things are hard enough, but when translation is happening on the fly, it's an extremely risky and arguably irresponsible move to share any new information that has yet to be presented to the public in a controlled environment. I specify controlled environment because, particularly in Nintendo's case, controlled dissemination of information has been the backbone of their announcements ever since 2011. Nintendo Direct is a Nintendo-produced video showcase of new video game-related announcements given directly by Nintendo staff to the consumer. The power of Nintendo Direct as a format is undoubtedly one of the brand's strongest weapons in the digital age, circumventing the need for traditional news outlets and interviews, and instead offering up the information in their own, handcrafted way. Nintendo Directs are particularly powerful because, as I mentioned before, they allow Nintendo to control the narrative. The Nintendo Direct initiative has become something of a phenomenon amongst consumers, and has since been imitated by other major players in the game industry. When these broadcasts are made, every word spoken is part of a tightly controlled script that has no room for deviation, and no room for error. It is the ideal platform to use when revealing new information. For this reason, I firmly believe Masuda's choice to disclose such a dramatic change in the next Pokemon installment was a huge misstep, and one that could have been properly positioned during a Nintendo Direct. Once again, I'll explain exactly how a bit later. Continuing along our timeline, two days after the start of the controversy, Masuda reiterates the decision. While it's true he cites why the choice was made, the specific details and process for this choice are left relatively ambiguous. Furthermore, the full scale of the outcry is not addressed in the statement. This comes across as somewhat out of touch with consumers. When a drastic change is made, people will generally want to understand it thoroughly. Masuda is stuck in a difficult position here, as it is likely he is not fully aware of the magnitude of this controversy and also is not able to fully disclose these details for reasons having to do with non-disclosure and production obligations. In any market, it is very difficult to make a decision that deviates from convention and demand consumers to just trust your choice, though some companies, like Apple, get away with it much more easily. Conversely, it is particularly difficult with the gaming market, whose user base is typically very active online and on social media, as well as very resistant to change. It would take some two weeks before the official statement from Masuda addressing the fan outcry would come to light. Naturally, this letter was written in Japanese and translated to English, but the key takeaway is that he and the team are aware of the community's feelings and share their passion, and makes assurances that the missing characters will return in future installments. While this sentiment is valued, what's still missing is the justification. He specifies that the choice was difficult, but once again fails to go into the exact details as to why the choice was made in the first place. Up to this point, the labor needed for animations and models, alongside some changes to game balance, have been loosely defined in previous statements, 
But even now, the new statement fails to directly address the reason for the choice and how it was justified. For a large section of the community, the letter simply falls flat. What should have been said here is a promise that the decision was made for a good reason, and that as the game is released, these reasons will be formally understood or even explicitly revealed. Also useful would be suggesting that the team wanted to try something new with this game, and while it may come as a shock, it was done with good intentions. Lastly, an appeal for fans to have faith and give them a chance before rendering judgment would be a good middle ground to round things out. The following months are total radio silence on the controversy. This is generally not a good tactic when a public is still actively engaged with an issue. Following this, Game Freak gets the Game Informer coverage, and for what feels like the first time, consumers are given some real insight to the advantages of the controversial choice and how the choice was made. One of the greatest flaws of the Pokemon games in a competitive sense is that the best teams of Pokemon tend to boil down to a select handful of choices despite there being over 800 options to choose from. This lack of competitive diversity would dissuade most from using certain Pokemon, including ones they like, if using said option meant losing would be guaranteed. In this interview, it is implied for the first time that these balance changes coming with the roster cut also serve to make all playable Pokemon now viable. While this has yet to be proven in practice, and Masuda was unable to go into further details at the time, this is really the first time this information has been presented. First and foremost, that it took five months to address this in any direct way, again, is a huge no-no in brand management. Another big issue is that this was presented not during a Nintendo-related broadcaster interview, but instead through a news publication. For a company that has the resources to produce their own programming like Nintendo Direct, the fact that this crucial detail was saved for an interview with a third party is almost unforgivable. It betrays the entire purpose of the Nintendo Direct, and worst of all, might not even be seen by the target audience, but instead only by readers of Game Informer. At the risk of being anecdotal, I myself read this interview when it was published, and it completely changed my perception of the game. With such a profound impact on me as a consumer, I can only wonder how this impacted others. Failing to provide the same information in a Nintendo Direct or in the months leading up to now leaves me asking a single question. What were they thinking? With all this said, the final act of this controversy leading to the game's release is the data leak and cancellation of the launch event. The alleged leaked information details exactly which Pokemon are cut from the game, and with that comes over 50% of them. Had Game Freak or Nintendo broadcast the contents of that Game Informer interview themselves, this leaked information may not come as such a blow to the consumer. But because it has been exposed to the public in a format not controlled by the company, they've arrived at their own conclusions. Topping things off, the cancellation of the Pokemon launch event in Tokyo is as ambiguous as the reasons to cut the Pokemon from the game, and only provoked further speculation and rumors from consumers. I should acknowledge that for the most part, I've only talked about the impact on the Western market with this new controversy. However, as it turns out, the Pokemon company did not reveal to the Japanese market that the new Pokemon game did not have all of the Pokemon. This has come as a very negative surprise to the Japanese consumers. Rounding things out with the allegations that Game Freak lied about starting from scratch with their models and animations leaves a horrible stink in the air, and with the Game Freak lied hashtag, this cements a firmly damaged relationship with consumers. For this final scenario, one could consider it best to cut their losses and try to seize the buzz of the leak by making announcements alongside it. This eases the blow to morale within the organization and involves the company in the reveal. The other option is to remain focused on the goals of the upcoming release and simply remain silent, as the company seems to have opted to do. With all of these missteps along the way, it's no wonder the last six months have been rough for Game Freak. And I'd now like to take the chance to cover precisely how I believe Game Freak should have behaved from the very start of this debacle, starting with the E3 presentation. Firstly, it should be an understood fact that developers and representatives from Game Freak, or any company for that matter, should not disclose a dramatic change in features during the Treehouse Live showcase unless it was already addressed directly in the preceding Nintendo Direct. Any new information can be easily misconstrued, so it would be prudent to remain focused on the content that has already been disclosed. Regardless of when it was said, it was likely understood internally that there would be backlash for the choice to remove a large number of Pokemon from the games. For this reason, the best way to approach this is by directly controlling the narrative with the use of a Nintendo Direct presentation. In this presentation, new details about the game and its features would be detailed, and at some point, perhaps during a transition to the section discussing new Pokemon, it would be the time to talk about the cuts.
Positioning the change as Game Freak wanting to try something new and experiment with new game balancing techniques would have been a safer way to approach this. It's also a good practice to directly acknowledge that something might not be ideal for every person when they first hear about it, but once players get their hands on the game, things should become a bit more clear, particularly when it comes to understanding what exactly Game Freak's goals were and how they reached their decision. Game Freak could have very easily seized this opportunity to turn what seems like a disadvantage into one of its greatest strengths. By focusing exclusively on the gameplay changes that come from making this decision, they could have completely repositioned the perception of this change. Rather than it being something that is completely frowned upon, it could have been something that is perceived as an actual benefit. Even if they had to keep some of these details under wraps, teasing it as something for fans to look forward to is generally a good way to go. Lastly, they should conclude by saying that the future is bright for the franchise, and that down the road, each and every Pokemon will have their day in the sun once again, asking once again for consumers to have faith before making their judgment. By handling things in this manner, it becomes much easier to deliver the bad news to fans, and mitigate any potential fallout. Additionally, the information is delivered with a formal translation and a script to make sure the content is delivered appropriately, and not on the dangerous whims of a live translation. In conclusion, the only thing left for Game Freak now is the future. How will they adapt to the many problems that have befallen the release window of Pokemon Sword and Shield? It is my opinion that they should focus heavily on restoring their rapport with fans and work immediately on rebuilding trust. This includes transparency and communication taking a front seat. Also hurting Game Freak is the ongoing perception that the labor of making Pokemon games is too much for them. While it may be a great deal challenging for the studio, Pokemon is also the single most profitable franchise in the world, even more valuable than Mickey Mouse. With this in mind, the notion that Game Freak should be treated as an independent studio rather than a AAA powerhouse needs to be flipped on its head. Spreading teams too thin and making excuses about the challenges of development when less profitable series are doing more impressive things on a technical and professional level bodes very poorly for the company. If they want to restore the faith consumers need in them, it's time they start acting like the juggernaut their company actually should be, and not like the inexperienced, understaffed wheelhouse they seem to personify. With all that said, this has been Standpy. Thank you so much for listening. I'm curious to know if you have any personal feelings about the Pokemon Sword and Shield controversy. Did this affect your choice to get the game in any way, or has it made no impact on you whatsoever? I'd also like to know if it had any impact on your perception of Game Freak or Nintendo, and anyone else involved in the production of these titles. Please let me know in the comments. Also be sure to check out some of my other videos here on the channel. And if you enjoyed this one, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. Until next time, this is Standpy blasting off again.